the rate that's about half patients and half providers. So I'm just happy that, uh, that everybody who cares deeply about this condition um, is, is together in one, one room tonight. So welcome. May is Public Care Awareness Month. Uh, uh, Stephanie Pendergrass and I are very uh, involved in the International Public Pain Society which is a professional society devoted to, uh, to public pain issues, uh, and May is Public Pain Awareness Month, so the, the timing of this event is, is good. Uh, I want to start with a couple of disclaimers. For educational purposes, we're making a video and audio recording uh, of the event, uh, and so I'd, I'd ask you to hold your questions to the discussion session at the end. Uh, so the initial talks will be will be uh, posted online, but none of the discussion at the end. So I just ask you to hold your questions to them. Um, and Dr. Krages and I receive funding from National Institutes of Health, uh, and the views that we're going to talk about tonight uh, are our own views and don't necessarily uh, represent the views of the NIH. So um, let me tell you, this is basically the breakdown of what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to give you some words about what's new on the research front. Um, and then Dr. Gonzalez is going to tell you uh, about what's, uh, how is CPPS diagnosed medically. And really, I think a question on a lot of patients' minds is, do I really have the right diagnosis? Is there something else going on with me? Is this really the thing that, that fits the best? Uh, and so he's going to talk about how, how you can really be sure uh, that this is the right uh, diagnosis. Uh, and then Stephanie and Dan will talk about how physical therapists uh, approach treating this condition, which I think you will see links nicely with uh, the, a lot of the research that, uh, that, that I've been doing, um, as well as other research at the NIH. So let me tell you what's new on the, on the research front. Um, and actually, before I do this, all of these talks we should wrap up in uh, maybe uh, 15 minutes, 55 minutes, something like that. If you have to step out at any point, please feel free to do so, and the restrooms are, are right next to us here. And then we'll open it up for, for discussion after that. Um, okay, so I think it's really important that everybody realizes where their tax dollars are going to understand chronic prostate type. Um, so the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, is the primary biomedical research agency of the U.S. government. It's a collection of institutes that uh, each focus on a different area of human health. Uh, and pelvic pain is mainly studied uh, by a particular institute called the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. And millions of dollars are provided for pelvic pain research uh, for both male and pelvic pain research uh, annually. So that the NIH understands this is a huge problem that affects millions of individuals in the U.S. and it's really committed to, uh, to doing something about it. Uh, one of the products of the NIH that you may have already come acro across as either a patient or provider, for example, um, is the NIH uh, Chronic Prostatitis Symptom Index, the CPSI. It's a validated questionnaire for, for pelvic pain. Uh, it looks at the presence and the impact of symptoms in the areas of pain, urinary function, and, and quality of life. And it's really the standard that's used for both clinical care and research. If we're doing a research study on a particular treatment, a particular amount of decrease of symptoms is needed on this questionnaire to defend that it's, it's a, uh, an effective uh, treatment. So speaking about treatment studies, uh, what have we learned uh, about uh, the, the uh, ways of, of treating uh, CPPS? So a first important thing to note is that several studies have indicated that there's no strong evidence for antibiotics. There have been three large clinical trials, uh, one of an antibiotic, one of an alpha blocker, uh, and uh, one uh, of a neural agent called regabalin. Uh, and there have been many smaller studies Unfortunately, none of them have identified what we call a generally effective therapy, meaning you know, if you're diagnosed with this condition and you walk into the door, that there's no single therapy that can, can be guaranteed to work for everyone. And so what the NIH has been doing is putting a lot of effort into trying to figure out better what the biology of this condition is, what's actually going on in the body. We can't just throw a particular drug at it and expect it to work. We have to really understand the biology. So the NIH has been funding a lot of what are called natural history studies. They're not targeted at any particular treatment. They really just observe uh, different aspects of, uh, of function in the body, try to figure out what makes a person with these symptoms different than a person who doesn't have the symptoms, uh, what makes a person who started tending to get better different than a person who's not uh, tending to get better, uh, things like that. The, uh, the NIH has been putting a lot of effort into what's called the MAP Research Network, and I do a lot of work uh, in that network. 
It's the multidisciplinary approach to the study of chronic pelvic pain, or MAP. And it's a, a study across many centers, many sites across the United States are all dedicated to this effort of uh, trying to understand better the biology before we jump into the next treatment trial, which will hopefully happen um, uh, shortly. So what have we learned from, from, uh, from the MAP research network? A couple of things. One is that there's no definitive biomarker for this condition, meaning there's no protein that you could isolate from the urine or the blood that really that is a marker of this condition. Similarly, since a lot of people with this condition have been on antibiotics at some point over the course of their treatment, it's also really important to note that there are no clear microorganisms. There's no one little bug that uh, seems to be present uh, in the hundreds uh, and hundreds of people that have been studied with this condition. Now let me start the link to physical therapy. What is consistent about this condition? Well, one of the things that we've learned studying the brain of men with this condition uh, is that there is a particular brain region, I've got it labeled up there, called SMA, supplementary motor area. Uh, it's kind of right at the top of your head and right in the middle. And what the job of that brain region is, is to control your pelvic floor muscles and to regulate how tight they are, how relaxed they are, and we see a lot of evidence that there's something very particular going on in that location of the brain uh, in men with, uh, with pelvic pain compared to people uh, uh, without. So, like I said, the main function of that region is to control uh, the pelvic floor muscles, uh, and what we think is that maybe the changes in the way that region is functioning that is really being the contributor to why these symptoms persist over such a, a long period of time. So what, is that, what does that mean? What, what, why is that region changing? Well, here's a hypothesis. Here's a guess for what might be happening. So I think that a lot of people with this condition, they recognize that there was some kind of triggering cause. There was either trauma or there was uh, a particular infection, perhaps some other event happened that precipitated or started the onset of these symptoms. And what we really think is that that is fading out over time. Maybe it doesn't disappear immediately. Maybe it's not you know, instantaneously that that infection is gone. But it's fading out over a period of time. And what's coming on instead is the brain's adaptation to it, the brain sort of trying to adapt the body to that initial, uh, what was, for lack of a better word, called insult to the pelvic region. And what that does is it alters pelvic floor muscle control. And then over time, that tension in the pelvic floor muscles is what leads to these uncomfortable, um, uh, uncomfortable sensations, uh, perhaps changes in bowel and bladder function, and the other kind of uncomfortable uh, uh, sensations and symptoms uh, that go with this condition. So I think this model right now is probably what we have the best evidence for uh, in MAP. Now, is physical therapy the optimal treatment for them? No, I think that we are probably going to develop hopefully better and better treatments to help physical therapists treat this even better and make the recovery even faster. But what we know about the moment is that physical therapy is probably what has the best evidence uh, for its effectiveness in this condition based on what we've observed is going on in the, in the brain of men with, with pelvic pain. Where do we go from here? Well, we're running a number of uh, additional research studies to really confirm this hypothesis. What you see in your packet uh, is a little bit of information about a study that I'm, that's funded by the NIH that I'm running here uh, to look at how those changes in supplementary motor area actually do change pelvic floor control in men with chronic prostatitis. Uh, UCLA is running a three-year study of men and women uh, with pelvic pain. Um, and I, given these two studies and other studies, I anticipate that we really are getting closer to understanding the biology of what's going on, and we'll be able to design new and exciting treatments. And those studies will probably start, I would imagine, in sort of 2019, 2020. So, I mean, I know that that's a little bit off. I know that everyone with this condition wants, uh, you know, a, a cure and a really great treatment right away. But I think it is exciting that we're getting closer finally. <coughs> Uh, to something more concrete. And in the meantime, what this means is right now we don't have any generally effective therapies. We can't give you something that's necessarily starting to work immediately. However, in the meantime, if you work closely with urologists, physical therapists, other care providers, it's not that there are no effective treatment plans out there. It's just that you have to personalize it, customize it, 
and I think figure out what works best for you. And uh, the other panelists will, will tell you more about how that works currently. So how can you get involved as a patient? Uh, if you're able to, uh, please participate in research studies. It's the way that we can learn more about this condition. And then I think as a provider, as much as you possibly can, uh, also get involved with the research uh, process. Standardize your treatments. Get involved with research to use standardized assessments to know whether your treatments are working uh, and gather as much uh, data about as many patients uh, as you possibly can to, uh, to guide our, for our future research studies. Uh, so with that, I'll give it to Dr. Gonzalez who will tell you about the medical management of this condition. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this panel. We're really excited to, uh, to give this talk today because, um, as I think you'll see across the, the course of this lecture, it really does sometimes take a village to treat patients with chronic pelvic pain um, or prostatitis. Um, and we need to know and understand more about the condition so we can better serve patients. So um, just some background on uh, the condition itself. Prostatitis is the most common urinary tract problem for men younger than age 50, and the third most common urinary tract problem for men older than 50. So it's, it's a very common uh, complaint that we see. It accounts for about 2 million visits to healthcare pro providers in the US each year. Chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which is primarily what we're focusing on tonight, affects 10 to 15% of the US male population. And um, it can occur at any age. Um, one thing that I think is interesting being um, the medical provider on this panel is that um, we're not taught a lot about this in training. I'm not that far out from training, um, but this is probably the most, one of the most common things that I see in, in clinical practice on a daily basis. I'm a urologist by training. I focus on male and female sexual health. And a large um, proportion of my patients for whatever reason, they're, I don't know if they're finding me through physical therapy referrals or um, online resources, a lot of my patients um, are coming in with symptoms that are suspicious for chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And most of them have seen not one, but multiple providers. Most of them have been placed on weeks, if not months of antibiotics, um, and really not seen any, any symptom improvement and they're frustrated, and if it's affecting how they urinate, or how they move their bowels, or certainly if it's affecting their sexual function, it's taken a huge toll on um, their quality of life um, and their psychological well-being. So that's sort of how I receive them, and then have to then um, slowly unpack what the issue is and work with um, other providers who, who sort of focus on this space. So it's. It's a really important thing that we're doing here tonight, starting this conversation, and hopefully uh, we'll continue this. But I just want to go over briefly um, the NIH classifications of prostatitis. Uh, so it is split up into four different categories. Category one is known as acute bacterial prostatitis. Category two is chronic bacterial prostatitis. Category three is chronic prostatitis slash chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And that is further divided into type A, which is inflammatory, and type B, which is non-inflammatory. And category four is known as asymptomatic inflammatory prostatitis. Going through these individually, um, how do you know if you have acute bacterial prostatitis? Um, it's, it's the one type of prostatitis that we often see patients who appear very sick. So often they will have very high fevers, they will report chills, myalgias, nausea, sort of constitutional, systemic-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms, um, and those are often present with um, really irritated urinary symptoms. So burning when they urinate, blood in their urine, sometimes they can have blood in their ejaculate, uh, frequency and urgency are common complaints. Um, pain is very common with this. Um, it's more of an acute onset pain, and it's, it can be pr pretty significant and pretty severe. Um, and the pain, but the pain can exist in multiple places, so it can be lower abdominal pain, can be flank pain, it can be pain in the perineum, it can be testicular pain, it can be rectal pain. Um, all of these are sort of clues um, that someone could potentially have uh, an acute case of prostatitis, and it presents pretty rapidly. I mean, it's, it's not, oh, this has been going on for six months. Um, it's more... You know, over the weekend I wasn't feeling well, these symptoms suddenly came on, now I'm spiking a fever of 102. So 
Um, and oftentimes these patients, um, it, depending on how old they are, how um, other, you know, other comorbidities they may have, um, sometimes have to be hospitalized and put on IV antibiotics for them to get better. They can develop abscesses, so it can be a, a pretty significant um, uh, clinical issue. Um, moving on to category two, chronic bacterial prostatitis. This is caused by chronic bacterial infection of the prostate with or without prostatitis symptoms. So the sort of classic way that this presents um, is a person who has recurrent UTIs. These are documented UTIs, not suspected UTIs based off of clinical symptoms. Documented UTIs caused by the same organism. They're just not getting better. So they have E. coli in their urine. They get put on a week of a certain, an appropriate antibiotic. They come back a month later, same E. coli. Get maybe two weeks of antibiotics, they don't get better. Often these patients um, will present with a more subtle picture than the acute version, um, but will have to require sometimes prolonged antibiotics. <clears throat> Unfortunately, category three is often treated like category two, um, and they're also getting rounds and rounds and rounds of antibiotics. Um, but this is, should, in my mind, should be treated completely differently. And I think it's actually a shame that in our medical education we don't fully, we're not even told about really um, how important the pelvic floor is in treating this particular version of prostatitis. Um, and it wasn't really until my, um, my fellowship training that focused more on sexual health where I really started to work with physical therapists and appreciate how this entire category is, can be pretty much defined um, as a pelvic floor disorder. And I often tell my patients when I'm counseling them, you have a condition called chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain disorder, or syndrome, excuse me. It's a horrible name for what you have because I don't think you actually have an infection or inflammation of your prostate. And people get very scared by the word chronic. So um, I tell them I think it's a problem of your muscles in your pelvis that you can't see. And we're going to send you to the right person to help you fix that. And I'm going to work with that person to try to get you better. Um, so uh, this, this pr particular version of prostatitis uh, is often characterized by chronic pelvic pain um, with or without voiding symptoms in the absence of a urinary tract infection. Um, op antibiotics are often prescribed, as I mentioned before, but not usually helpful. Um, and anti-inflammatories and physical therapy, um, I wrote, are very useful. I would say they're absolutely essential in treating uh, patients with uh, category 3 prostatitis. Um, this can present in very different ways, and I'm going to go over some of the symptoms that can broadly categorize prostatitis uh, in a minute, but it can, it can present in very, very subtle ways. Lastly, asymptomatic inflammatory prostatitis is just prostate inflammation in the absence of symptoms. This is essentially an incidental finding on either a biopsy that someone may get for um, uh, elevated PSA, or maybe they underwent a bladder outlet procedure where certain you know, pro prostate tissue was resected and it's found on histology after the fact, or patients who have fertility workups who get a semen analysis and white blood cells are noted uh, in the semen sample, but they, it's in the absence of symptoms. This is not something, unless, it, unless they're trying to get pregnant and having trouble, that we typically treat because um, of the absence of symptoms. So how do we evaluate prostatitis? We already sort of alluded to um, metrics that, we, that are used by the NIH um, and in clinical uh, practice and research um, to help sort of uh, quantify the severity of patient symptoms. Um, physical exam is really important. Um, doing a digital rectal exam, obviously, to feel the prostate. Things that are found um, uh, on the prostate assessment can be helpful to distinguish between acute bacterial prostatitis and some of the, more, the uh, category two and category three kinds of prostatitis. Um, in acute prostatitis, often the, the prostate will feel boggy, is the classic description, um, and be exquisitely tender to the touch. Um, that would be a, uh, a clue that someone may have the acute bacterial version of prostatitis. Um, I will typically do a urine analysis and send that for culture. I do that even for patients who have had symptoms for six months. It's an easy test to do. It's an easy thing to rule out. Um, uh, so that, you know, that's generally recommended. Um, there's something called the two cup test, which is essentially a urine analysis and culture done um, pre and post prostate massage um, that can be helpful in distinguishing the, the chronic versions of prostatitis. 
Um, imaging is, is typically used for acute bacterial prostatitis or refractory cases. Um, say if you're treating someone with category 2 chronic bacterial prostatitis and they're not getting better, you'd want to assess for uh, an abscess of some sort. Um, Uroflow is a um, metric that urologists use where a patient urinates into essentially a funnel um, that is attached to a scale and uh, their flow rate is calculated. Um, a PVR is just a post-void residual where we use a scanner to assess how much urine patients are holding on to. Um, this can be helpful because uh, you can distinguish whether patients um, have some evidence of restricted flow, which usually would indicate, that, you know, depending on their age, that they may have some pelvic floor um, muscle issue going on. Um, and post void residual just helps you quantify how much urine they're holding on to. Um, and that's something that you can track as you provide a treatment. Uh, there is, this isn't published at all, but I use the Uroflow a lot, even in um, patients that we see with chronic uh, prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. There is a sort of suspicious pattern that we see um, on Uroflow uh, that kind of clues me into that this is this. Uh, there's largely a, a muscle component here, and that's um, typically when we look at a Uroflow curve. It's it's like all great curves in science. It's a it should be a nice bell curve, um, and what you see is what we call a stuttering pattern. So you you come up like the classic um, bell curve would, and then you just see rapid firing instead of a nice smooth line. And that's literally spasm of their muscle interfering with the flow of their urine. So that's a clue for me that, that somebody I need to refer to a physical therapist. How do we treat? Um, it's important to classify these patients appropriately so that they don't get three months of antibiotics and not get better. Um, medical options do include antibiotic therapy. These are primarily helpful for the first two categories alone, um, despite us seeing chronic uh, pelvic pain patients get lots of antibiotics, um, and the duration of antibiotics depends on um, um, on how they do clinically. So acute bacterial prostatitis often will require two weeks of antibiotics. The chronic kind can sometimes require um, weeks to months. Um, alpha blockers can be helpful. Um, again, that's not backed up by good clinical data, but um, if patients are really complaining about restricted urinary stream, they're having to pee frequently and urgently because they're not emptying their bladder, it's something that I will put, on, put them on sometimes temporarily just to give them symptom relief. And I tell them, this is so you feel better, it's not solving the problem, we have to send you to physical therapy to fix the problem. Um, muscle relaxants, if they're really tense, can be helpful, there are certain neuromodulating agents uh, that can be helpful. Hospitalization, I put up there, that's more for really pay really sick patients with acute bacterial prostatitis. Um, these are some sort of non-medical treatment options that I think are sometimes even more helpful than anything I can do. Um, physical therapy, uh, psychological counseling, as I mentioned, for those patients who have had this for um, months and sometimes years, who it's really affected their entire life. Um, a lot of times it's helpful for them to have someone to talk to um, about how, how um, what a negative impact this has had on their, on their overall life. Um, stress reduction, acupuncture, um, avoiding bladder irritants is sometimes recommended. Uh, I think that has limited efficacy. Uh, some more classic treatments that we're taught as urologists are things like sitz baths. Um, Botox can be helpful in patients with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. And surgery, I put up there just as a treatment for patients more with the, the abscess complications and such. Um, I just want to briefly mention the U-point clinical phenotyping, which is um, gaining favor in the world of prostatitis. Um, it allows for uh, us to profile patient symptoms into six broad categories to allow individualized and often multifocal therapy. So this is where I think um, the U-point is really helpful. It, as I mentioned at the beginning part of my discussion, it really does take a village. There's not one thing that fixes everyone um, because it's not one thing that causes everyone's problem. So being able to um, categorize their symptoms into these six domains will help you address each of the problems of their condition and not just maybe focus on the urinary symptoms like we're taught to do as urologists. Um, so I think that that's uh, helpful. And you know, I feel very lucky to, to have found colleagues in the LA area to work with and refer to um, uh, because I don't, there's no way I could treat this uh, on my own. And I am, I'm very upfront with my patients at the beginning that 
medically, uh, I'm often limited in, in how, how much better I can get them. And, and that's hard, I think, for a lot of doctors to say. And I think they, unfortunately, uh, you, that allows them to dismiss patients' symptoms or complaints sometimes. Because we as physicians don't like to be able to say, I can't do anything for you. Um, so here's some antibiotics. Um, but I think it's an important thing to, to have uh, a sense of humility in that regard and say, I don't know, or I can't do anything in terms of prescribing you a medication, but there's somebody that I work with that's, that, that can fix your problem. So um, with that, I will uh, end over to my physical therapy colleagues. My name is Daniel Karajas. I'm a physical therapist here at USC. I will mirror the gratefulness that we as clinicians, as physical therapists, have, as you mentioned, you have someone to refer to. But it also goes the other way around, too. Because this is not a great, like, direct access population, right? Somebody comes into physical therapy necessarily. And we may have, they've come maybe on their own, or they've actually come through another channel of, of medicine and haven't really been examined thoroughly. And so to be able to identify physicians who can help you as a physical therapist if someone needs to be screened or you know, go through the diagnostic process, it's very useful to have folks as yourself too, Dr. Gonzalez. So with the differential diagnosis in mind that um, you just heard, really in the absence of any sinister pathologies ongoing, really comes down to is the prostate really involved or is there like a muscle function issue that's involved? And historically it's been most urologists have the muscles like really low on their list of potential differentials. And so now you know, it's been climbing in regard to something to think about. And that's where that U point is helpful because it's on the list. It's one of the things to identify are the muscles involved or is it just something going on with the plumbing itself. So, for those who are experiencing the symptoms, is that, can it really be my muscles? Like, is, are my muscles really something that might be involved here? And so, we believe that it truly can be, or at least the muscles are a contributor to the symptoms that someone's experiencing. And so we can look at some evidence. What is it, what is some evidence for that? We could say that there's some evidence that shows that pelvic floor muscle tenderness noted in 51% of patients with CPPS. Yet, tenderness in those same locations, it's only about 7% in those that don't have the symptom. So basically someone can say, well, if you poked me in those areas too, I, that would hurt, wouldn't it? But this is evidence here, this was in 2008, there was another study that was very similar to this, I think it was in the late 90s, that showed those actually with CPPS tend to have specific muscle tenderness. And if you were to take someone who did not have the symptom and poke in those same areas to palpate, typically they wouldn't. So it's not just the fact that it's a sensitive area, it's the fact that there's something different going on with those muscles potentially in those people with the issue than those without. Another thing would be that when you do palpate or touch the muscles in those specific areas, they can actually reproduce the actual symptoms that someone's experiencing. So perhaps touching the muscles in the perineum, which is the location right between the legs, may trigger someone's penis pain. Or touching the muscles that are around the anus may trigger, let's say, like the anal pain, without even getting close to where the prostate gland is itself. So that just shows that perhaps musculature is involved, and it's not something deeper within the urinary system only. Another thing would be taking a look at, well, does the muscle move? And so now there's some great imaging with sonography, ultrasound, where you can actually basically get a little x-ray vision, so to speak, of what's going on internally. It's a little bit more grainy than we would like, and maybe hopefully in the future it becomes a little bit more clear, but we can still see what's actually happening. And what they were looking at is you look at the base of the bladder. So when someone were to... If you can see the base of the bladder, and when someone contracts their pelvic muscle, the base of the bladder will lift. There's a certain amount of motion that the pelvic muscle goes through. Well, those people who do have CPPS tend to move significantly less than those people who don't, which potentially we could, that might speak to, we can hypothesize 
that maybe because those muscles are already active, there's not a lot more room for them to actually contract. For example, if you had a fist that's not closed all the way, but you know, fairly closed, and you say, well, how much motion can my fingers go through if my fist is like this, versus having it a little bit more open, well, you'll see more motion actually happen. So that perhaps is some evidence that yes, muscles might be involved as well. And one more piece is if you treat the muscle specifically, there's some decent evidence that shows that there's actually changes that happen significantly in reduction of someone's symptoms. So this is, again, in the absence of doing anything specifically to the prostate gland and just working on the muscles from an intervention, uh, a specific intervention, then people's symptoms can improve. And the way that they identify if symptoms have improved or not is oftentimes the that NIH, the, the CPSI that Dr. Ketch showed you in one of the early slides. So what are these pelvic floor muscles? They're internal, right? They're like invisible. There's something down here going on. I'm not sure where they are. Well, there's several muscles together, and we call them the pelvic floor muscles. But there's individual muscles that are there, but just think of it as a collection with multiple layers. And there's three main functions. One is supportive. So if we took a look at this model here, all of this reddish pink material is the pelvic floor muscle, and it's basically like the bottom of a bowl. So the pelvis was the bowl, they're down here. So what sits inside the bowl? Well, you've got the bladder, you have the prostate gland, and you have the rectum, and you have things that stack up on top of those. So this muscle has to support. It's on all the time, because otherwise things would be a little bit more dry. So it's working, it contracts at times, and it relaxes at times, and we have to have that nice balance where it doesn't stay on too much. So that's the supportive component. The next thing is sphincter function. Well, it's gotta keep the doors closed, right? So it has to keep the urethra closed in the front so that we're continent with our urine, and it has to keep the anus closed in the back so we're continent with our stool. And collectively, again, those are on all the time. Sometimes they turn on a little bit more, but they should always return back to their normal baseline level. That's the sphincter function. And then there's the sexual function. So some of the muscles within the perineum or the center part right between your legs are gonna contract. So when the prostate gland expresses the ejaculate into the urethra during sexual climax, it has to get out somehow. And that's these muscles that actually activate and contract vigorously five to six times to push the, the semen out. The other thing too is those muscles also work for us as men when we're urinating, because at the end of our urine stream, when our bladder stops, we still have urine in the line. So we have to contract our pelvic floor to clear the line so we don't dribble. And so that's the three functions of the pelvic floor. So you saw here on this model, but looking at it here on the screen, prostate gland is here, and the muscles are right underneath there. That's one part of the pelvic floor muscles. They make up maybe the sphincter component, and other muscles around there. There's also the anal component. There's also the part that's a little bit deeper, which is more the levator ani, the supportive function. And then you have these muscles through these, this area called the perineum that have to contract to push out the ejaculate or push out the remaining urine. This is another closer look of the perineum itself, where again, you can see the anus area here, you can see the, this area called the bulbospongiosis, that's the one that contracts around the urethra, the deeper layers. It's very, it's very intricate. Here's another image, this is looking from the front, the bulbospongiosis, here's the urethra, if someone had a penis, it, was, it would be coming out this way, and there's the urethra that goes through it. So this is the muscle that contracts to push out the urine, the last little bit, or actually the ejaculate, and then the other muscles that are around it. So what are, how does the muscle get its input, the signal? How does it know what to do? Well, there's a nervous system, right? And those nerves tell the muscles to turn on, tells it to relax. Basically, it gives it the, it plugs it in. And the main nerve is the pudendal nerve, which basically comes out of the second, third, and fourth holes of the sacrum here in the front, and then it becomes this pudendal nerve, and then from there, it has to go through different tunnels, behind some ligaments, over some muscles, between, you can see it kind of weaves its way from the sacrum down and around, 
And then from there, it branches off. And there's branches that go towards the rectal area. There's branches that go towards the perineum and branches that head out towards the penis and the testicles. Here's just another image. This is the perineal view, where you see pudendal nerve here, branches towards the rectal area, branches towards the perineum <coughs> the center point, and then those branches that run up. So a lot of input, a lot of, a lot of ways for muscles to maybe entrap a nerve, a lot of ways for the, the, the pain signal to be in an area that's <coughs> activating the body map and the brain based on how intricate the nervous system is there and the muscle system. So what are the symptoms when someone is experiencing CPPS? Well, they can be a full range, a full spectrum. Some people just have a kind of an annoying level and some people have a very severe. Some people have the whole spectrum. It just depends on what they're doing as to what triggers their symptoms on and off. A variety of patterns. It could be just at the anus. It could be in the perineum. It could be in the penis. It could be right above here, the suprapubic area. It could be kind of inner thigh area. There's a lot of different ways that people might express what they're feeling in terms of the location of the symptoms that they're having. It's not just a, this is pelvic pain and this is the way it presents. Everyone may have a little different component, different intensity, different location. Their descriptions might be a little bit different, but there's definitely a pattern behind it. So some may say it feels like a knot between my legs, or it feels like I'm sitting upon a golf ball. The tip of my penis burns. That might be with urination, might be with ejaculation, might just be with sitting. I have pain after ejaculation, burning feeling in my growing area. These are just samples. These are things that we as clinicians hear patients describe. Now this is a all of them. Of course, people can have others, but these are common ones or at least the general theme of what my people, people might be experiencing. What brings them on? Oftentimes sitting or physical activity. Emotional stress is one as well because there's behavioral components to this. Because the nervous system taps in to the brain and how we're feeling and the mood we're in and all those different things that can help to sensitize the nervous system. Bowel or bladder function, holding or even voiding. And then of course ejaculation, what we've talked about. Other symptoms that might overlay this, urinary frequency, or the inability to relax well, so the stream of the urine is a little bit more impeded. Or how about the fact that they don't relax well, maybe anteriorly, maybe they don't relax well posteriorly, so the stools are thin, fragmented, having difficulty. Maybe have to strain a little bit too allow their stool to exit. So those are the, what is the pelvic floor? What are the symptoms? But why is it difficult to find a physical therapist who knows about CPPS? Why is this challenging? Well, one of it is that there's minimal exposure in physical therapy. Curriculums are jam-packed. We as physical therapists work with patients of all kinds in the hospitals, in the sports facilities, in wherever. We are such a broad profession, which is great, but it's also not so great because you basically graduate as a basic knowledge of many different things. Here at USC, we have two hours first semester, two hours in this first summer, so that's four. Then we have another four hours, let's say that's eight and then another two. We probably have 12 hours of, of pelvic health. And you take that and you divide that between incontinence issues, um, pre and postpartum issues, and pelvic pain. And so it's basically an exposure. Someone is not graduating with the ability to maybe go right away and start working with complex cases of those with pelvic pain. The governance in our American Physical Therapy Association of pelvic health falls within the women's health section. So I say the governance, APTAs are a national organization. There's different sections, the orthopedic section, the neurological, neuro section, the cardiopulmonary section. Then there's a section on women's health. That is the section that pelvic health lives. And within that pelvic health is women's issues, men's issues, the pediatric 
pelvic health issues, transgender pelvic health issues. So it falls under this umbrella of women's health, which right away makes it difficult for a male to kind of locate where am I supposed to go. And even if you went on the APTA website, find a PT, and you try to figure out how do I filter, you would have to click on the women's health. And the general public isn't thinking that that's where I need to click if you're a male looking for it. So that's the governance issue. We're working on it. We're working on it. I'm part of the section of women's health and I'm part of the name change task force. So for the last year and a half, we've been trying to change the name somehow. That's challenging. It, so. <laughs> it also requires a PT to be comfortable with the pelvic region. Not everyone wants to work down here. Hey, anyway, as for you, that's, I, don't, uh, I don't deal with that. No. Urine, stool, no, no. So it already takes a certain person to be able to feel desensitized. Say, I need to go into that. I can help. There's a lot of people who need help, and that's okay. I'm okay with going into that area because I want to help people. But not everybody does, so you have another little subset of people. So that's a special. And then there's the specialized care. It's thought as be super specialized care. But really, it's the same things we do with other people. You work with muscles, you do exercise, you do hands-on stuff, you do education. We use the same codes as anybody else. But the thought is that the super specialized, yes, there's a knowledge base you have to know, but it is something that is definitely a <coughs> And then, how do you learn? Well, people go to Con Ed classes. There's some great continuing education courses. That's where most pelvic health therapists probably, I should, Probably that's where they are, that's the rule, right? Because they're not leaving school with it. There's some great courses that people can take to upgrade their knowledge base. But they have to be passionate about it and still find them. And yeah, they're costly, and they're usually not local, but if you really want to make sure that you're upgrading your knowledge in this, they so much should be able to find something for you know, what they're looking for. And then the idea of complex cases. It's not easy working with folks who have more persistent pain in the pelvic area. And some people, they want to say, eh, maybe I'll just work with things that are a little simpler. But again, it takes a special PT to be able to say, I'm going to go into this world, and I'm going to try to figure this out as best I can, offer what I have to offer, play detective, and then help these people improve their quality of life. So that's why it's not so easy to find a PT. There's a lot of hurdles to get through to find the person. And here's one of the people now who you know what they come up with. Okay, so feel free to move about the cabin. You guys can pick it up. I know we've been sitting for a little while. Um, but I am honored to be here tonight to talk about pelvic floor physical therapy and what it actually looks like. Because what you're hearing so far is when people present with these urinary issues, erectile dysfunction, perineal pain, it doesn't register physical therapy for many people. And what Dr. Kutch is doing and Dan Kraj is here at USC is so important with the research that they're doing. I've been working with men and women with complex pelvic pain specifically since 2001. I'm going to tell you what I saw. Between 2001 and 2005 or 6, people were getting very excited because all of a sudden pelvic floor muscle dysfunction was a thing. And a reason why their surgeries weren't working and why men and women did have urinary bowel bladder disorders. Then somewhere around 2004, pudendal neuralgia became the hot topic and everything was a pudendal nerve. As we got into later years, we now know it's a combination of muscles, very rarely the prostate, occasionally the pudendal nerve, but also the involvement of the brain and the body's response to persistent pain, which unfortunately has gone on in people with earlier diagnosis longer than it should have. So the research that they're doing now is filling in the gap about what can we do with the central nervous system and the response to this. So it's a muscle issue, it's a nerve issue, and it's a central nervous system issue, and at the end of the day, it's a person issue. And the research that they're doing and events like this will help get this out of the hands of the specialists and into those in the regular urology clinics, primary care, so people can stop suffering as long as they have. So when we start to look at a physical therapy evaluation, as you're hearing, there is a pelvic floor muscle issue in many patients, 97% of them, that present with this quote, quote, prostatitis diagnosis. 
So the important things that we want to look in the clinic is figure out how did your symptoms start? In some cases, it may be something that may not be identifiable. Maybe you started to notice you were peeing a little bit more frequently than you used to, or the strength of your ejaculate is different. Or you could have been hiking in Runging Canyon and felt a pain in your butt, and the next day noticed that your testicle was swollen. So sometimes people know what has happened, sometimes people do not. During the evaluation, we need to start to figure these things out. We also want to know about current urinary bowel and sexual function. How many times a day are you urinating? Normal is six to eight times in a 24-hour period, and you should not be waking up at night if you're under the age of 35 to go to the bathroom. You want to know about your pain symptoms. Typically, things start out better during the day, but as the day goes on, you're going to kind of start to feel worse. It's going to be hard to quantify how exactly it feels after you exercise, after you work, after you sit, how Monday is versus Friday. What are your functional limitations? How hard is it to function for you at work? How distracted are you? Can you meet your responsibilities at home? Have you had to stop exercising? All of these things can play a role in what's happening now and what's happened along the way. Something that's important to know is about past treatments and effectiveness. Have you been put on antibiotics for three months? They maybe made you feel better for the first week, but that's also because there's an analgesic in most antibiotics, erroneously giving patients the impression that it may actually be a bacterial infection because they'll feel better taking them. So that's important to know about what treatments you have undergone and what effect that they've had on you. We want to know about the severity, the duration, and the length of medical management and treatment. And of course, how much emotional distress, general stress, and situational anxiety is happening around this diagnosis. As everybody on the panel has said, many of our patients have been through three, four, five, six providers, sometimes for longer than they should have been, because it's being erroneously called prostatitis, and this was never the problem to begin with. So as we started to talk about with physical therapy, we hear pelvic floor dysfunction, but this is rarely isolated to the pelvic floor. So when we start with the physical therapy evaluation, we need to pair what you've said during your history to things that we're going to look at during the evaluation. So these examples are from Travell and Simons that show different trigger points in the muscles that attach to the pelvic girdle. So many people don't realize that, especially in men, the quadratus lumborum can cause referred pain to the testicle. Trigger points in the adductor can cause urinary urgency, frequency, testicular pain, and inner thigh pain. Muscles of the external rotators can refer to the tailbone as well as the genitals. It's important to note that while these muscle dysfunctions can cause pain on their own, the muscles that attach to the pelvic girdle can also have a negative impact on pelvic floor dysfunction overall. So in addition to the local pain they can cause, it can also impair your pelvic floor muscle function to keep things persisting longer than it should. In addition to... Oops, I had a different slide. So there also peripheral nerves um, can cause a problem. So this can be the sciatic nerve, can cause pain around your sit bone and down your leg. Genitofemoral and ilioinguinal nerve, common in brown scars after appendectomy or male hernias, can cause pain to the penis, the scrotum, and the testicle. Burning pain, referred pain to the inner thigh. One that's often missed and often interchangeably used with the pudendal nerve is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. This nerve runs in the back of your thigh. It can cause pain with sitting, testicular pain, and urinary urgency and frequency. We are also going to look at joints and biomechanics. So in a lot of our male patients, there may be a biomechanical onset of this. It could be that they are somebody who exercises a graphic group, perhaps with anatomy that isn't meant to do CrossFit. So low loaded squats, for example, are okay for some men, but they're not okay for others. Long bike riding is okay for some men, and it's not okay for others. What's the difference? Probably their underlying anatomy and biomechanics makes certain activities okay for some men, but not for others. Not all of these activities are bad, but there can be anatomic predisposition dispositions that lead people into the development of these symptoms. So before we even get to the pelvic floor, we have to take a look at how this started, what are these external factors, where are your symptoms, do they sound like a muscle, do they sound like a nerve, do they sound like a joint, and then we'll go internal. So during the internal examination, we're going to examine the pelvic floor, as Dr. Kraj has said, for tenderness and pain. 
So in more cases than not, men with CPPS do have tenderness and pain in the pelvic floor muscles, whereas regular people did not have that. We're examining different muscle groups in three different areas to determine where the sources of dysfunction are. We're going to look at the length of those muscles to determine if they can effectively contract. More often than not, strength is not a factor in our patients with CPPS. And motor control, can you squeeze your muscles when I ask you to? Can you relax them when I'm asking you to? More cases than not, the answer is going to be no because these muscles are impaired. We're also going to do a pudendal nerve examination. This nerve is highly specific in that it innervates the penis, parts of the perineum, the anus. It controls the pelvic floor muscles. And unlike any other peripheral nerve in your body, this has sensory fibers, motor fibers, and autonomic fibers. So just like we breathe without thinking about it, our congenital nerve is helping us maintain continence or causing ejaculation without us thinking about it. But if we decided to override it right now by squeezing or stopping your urine stream or trying to allow a bowel movement to evacuate, you can override pudendal nerve function, but also it just exists, which makes this disorder and pelvic floor dysfunction something that takes a little longer to treat than other parts of the body because it's always active and these muscles never relax. <coughs> We can also evaluate the coccyx while we're doing the internal examination to determine if there is an issue at the coccyx, but I would say, again, more often than not, that tends to be a symptom and not a cause. So the important thing that physical therapists are going to do after we take the history and do the examination is really link together what the symptoms are, what our objective findings are, and how did this happen. So we're gonna help the patient identify how they got to this place and basically what we're going to do to fix it. We also need to know what other overlapping issues are a factor. There's often comorbidities. They can be structural, anatomic, biomechanical. They can involve the gastrointestinal system. Very rarely is there actually a urologic infection base, but it could be in a small percentage of people. And we wanna establish short and long-term goals. So short-term goals include things like helping our patient regain motor control so they are able to completely empty their bladder. A longer-term goal, which would probably be 8 to 12 visits, is they have complete pelvic floor motor control so their urinary stream is never impaired. A short-term goal could be reducing pelvic floor hypertonus so there isn't perineal pain with sitting. A longer term goal would be our patient can sit for four to six to eight hours without a cushion, without perineal pain. We set small term goals in physical therapy tied to objective findings that we're trying to change and link them to long term functional outcomes that will help people regain their quality of life. So as we talk about the treatment, one of the most important things that we talk about is patient education and pain science. So recovering from a syndrome, like chronic pelvic pain syndrome, is very different than acute prostatitis, where you're going to take an antibiotic, and in two weeks, this is going to be a thing of the past. What's important to understand is that this treatment progression for this is different, but it is possible. Clearly, I have a lot to say on the topic. If you're interested, you can read Pelvic Pain Explained. But part of this is patient education, and often when people do have misdiagnosis and they're not getting better, they go to Google and they find that they've got this terrible disease that's never going to be treated. That's not the case, but a lot of people aren't getting the help that they need. So we need to educate people about what the proper treatment progression is. In the clinic, we're going to likely do manual therapy to help restore normal muscle tone, decrease the pressure on the nerves, restore normal joint mechanics and function. We're gonna support that with the home exercise program. The treatment duration varies. Typically patients are seen one to two visits per week, especially initially for about eight to 12 weeks. And based on the severity and the chronicity of the problem, there's gonna be some variations for that. <coughs> So once people get diagnosed, in an ideal world, you go to physical therapy, four to six visits, everything's fine, you're jumping for joy, this is over. This is not the case with chronic pelvic pain syndrome, but that does not mean that you are not going to get better. 17 years of experience with this diagnosis, there's going to be excitement when you finally find out what's wrong with you. 
there's going to be, oh, do I really have to go see this person once or twice a week? You're going to feel good, you're going to feel bad, and it's going to go up and down on a, hopefully a slow progression out. So I want to spend some time talking about when you hit those hiccups. So when you start physical therapy and things are good and then maybe they're not, or maybe you start physical therapy and you can't tolerate it, period. There's often reasons why, and physical therapists are well positioned with the amount of time that we have with our patients, which is typically an hour, to help figure out why there is a treatment pickup. So sometimes there can be an unmanaged pain disorder, central nervous system hypersensitivity, inappropriate pain medications. There could be a peripheral nerve problem that isn't allowing tolerance of therapy. Sometimes the manual therapy is too aggressive. Sometimes the manual therapy techniques are incorrect. As Dr. Karaj has explained, there's a variation in experience and skill set amongst people who are trying to help this patient population, and sometimes you may not be with the right person. Sometimes the home exercises or lifestyles can be problematic. Things can be introduced too early or not early enough. And it's rare but possible that there can be pelvic floor or pudendal nerve damage through things like surgery or actual traumas. Um, <coughs> We've seen unfortunate cases where the pelvic floor has been impaled from lawn ornaments and random things that shouldn't have happened. And in some of those cases, there is surgical decompression that could be necessary. More common is what happens when you plateau in physical therapy. You were doing a little bit better, but now you're kind of not. The important thing is a differential diagnosis and to understand why persisting symptoms are still present. There can be faulty neuromuscular patterns. For example, if somebody works as a checkout counter and they're constantly doing this all day, where they may be triggering their abdominal muscles again that's triggering the pelvic floor. There could be daily behaviors with bowel movements and things like bowel mechanics or urinary habits. The techniques could be incorrect or you could be working with somebody that's telling you to do kegels when really you need to be down training. The techniques that could be administered may not be frequent enough. Not everybody has access to pelvic floor physical therapy, and they may be traveling far distances and they can't get there. It may not be appropriate under those circumstances. It may not be a good use of their time. The primary drivers may be different than originally thought. What if Dr. Kutch's research is showing that some of this is top down and not just bottom up? What if we're not working enough with the central nervous system in certain cases and there needs to be a collaboration effect to help with the central and peripheral nervous systems at the same time? This always involves reevaluation and collaboration with other medical providers. And again, physical therapists are well positioned to do that because of the amount of time we're able to spend with our patients. So in the back of our minds, we're always thinking kind of about a diagnostic algorithm. And this can involve, physical therapy is only one portion of this bubble, as you can see. Behavioral health and mental health support can be very helpful, especially when we're trying to calm the nervous system or deal with the trauma of the medical goonery that may have happened to get people diagnosed in the first place. Pharmacology can be useful. It's not always mandatory unless there's an infection, but it can be supplemental. People's expectations for some of the medications are higher than what they're actually proven to do. And so education is important to talk about that. There's complementary alternative medications and therapies. There's interventional pain medicine, sometimes blocks and things like that can be effective. Dental <coughs> nerve blocks, sacral blocks, other types of nerve blocks, pelvic floor Botox, these things can and do have a place. There can be hormonal factors, surgery in some cases, and self-care is very important because this does take a period of time to create those two weeks. So with that said, I wanted to provide resources for how people can find a public floor physical therapist. There's three different institutions that are listed here. The American Physical Therapy Association, the International Public Pain Society, and Herman and Wallace Public Health Institute is also ways to find a provider. If you're curious, if they're capable of treating CPPS, you're more than welcome to ask the questions. How many men have you treated with this problem? What does a typical, typical treatment plan look like? Inquire about their background. Are you comfortable treating this? What does your comprehensive plan look like with your colleagues in our local community? All fair questions before you make your decisions to try to find somebody that can help.
So that wraps up the presentations and we can open it up for discussion. I hope the take home message for everybody is that the science tells us that the public choice is very important in these conditions. Uh, but uh, still, uh, as a patient, you have to find an individualized plan of care, choosing from the menu of options that are currently available. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to make those choices easier by matching them to exactly what's going on in the, in the biology. Uh, but I think we're on the right track with this condition. We're very excited. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. And let me open it up for questions for uh, panelists.